Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Steelers.com's NFL Draft Triple Take Podcast. I'm Mike Pursuta from Steelers.com and the Steelers Radio Network, joined, as always, by Dale Lolly from Steelers Nation Radio, SNR, and uh, Matt Williamson, Steelers Nation Radio, SNR. You can hear those two guys on Steelers Nation Radio on uh, the drive. Every day, you can uh, catch them on the Steelers radio network, uh, pregame, postgame, various times uh, in and around our seemingly never-ending Steelers coverage. We've got another uh, look at the upcoming draft today. We're going to take a look at the defensive tackles, the interior defensive linemen. And uh, before we get to the particulars of who's available, guys, I wanted to ask you kind of a conceptual question. Uh, We all got a real good look at the San Francisco 49ers early last season and that uh, seeming never-ending supply of number one pick defensive lineman the 49ers had. And they were able to ride that with about, I don't know, half a quarter of a Super Bowl championship. Uh, is, is this going to become a thing again? Uh, are we going to get back to the point where uh, you want to make sure you're getting pass rush, not just on the edge, but from those interior guys? they got to be a whole lot more than run stuffers now, don't they, Matt? agree. And the big run stuffing nose tackle types are slowly becoming dinosaurs in this league too. You see, they're not getting paid heavily. They're not getting drafted highly. You have to affect the passing game. And the Niners are a great example. I mean, the, the analytics folks will tell you that coverage and corners are more important than the men, guys up front, but I simply don't believe it. I mean, if you can get Aaron Donald's, Chris Jones's, those type of interior players, that affect the quick hitting passing game so quickly, I think it's a game changer. Yeah, I agree. I I think, you know, with so many teams uh, going to quick passing games, a three-step drops, five-step drops, you you very rarely see a a straight seven-step drop anymore. Um, You know, you have to get that immediate pressure. And so everybody uh, is looking for the next Aaron Donald. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the, the unicorn that, that you're looking for. And there's some guys in this, this draft that, that have those capabilities, uh, but you want that immediate pressure. And, and ideally you'd like them to be, uh, they have a little bit of length to them as well, that they can get their hands up and affect the passing lanes, those kind of things, even if they don't get there, um, you know, but I, I think Matt's right. We're seeing more and more teams go away from the, just the true run stuffers. You better be able to rush the passer at least a little bit, uh, you know, if you're going to uh, get paid in this league. Yeah. It's almost as if uh, you got to, you better be able to rush the passer and at least stop the run a little bit as opposed to the other way around. Because even though the running game is still important, it is being uh, de-emphasized relative to the passing game. And uh, I'm with you guys. That You better get some pressure. I don't care how good your secondary is. They can only cover for so long. And the pressure is going to help them do what they do. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the interior defensive lineman now uh, coming up uh, for uh, selection starting on April the 23rd. Uh, Dale, why don't you uh, lead us off uh, with your uh, number five prospect? Uh, number five, I got Neville uh, Gallimore from Oklahoma. Uh, he's 6'2", he's 304. Uh, you want a guy that can get up the field fast. Uh, he ran a 47940 at the scouting combine. Uh, he's a penetrator. You know, he, he needs to be a little more consistent with, with that kind of stuff. But man, he can get up the, uh, he, he can get up the field. Matt, uh, you went a different direction at number five, a uh, guy who a lot of people uh, have said a lot about throughout this process, Marlon Davidson of Auburn. Yeah, really interesting guy in that Auburn, and we'll get to another Auburn defensive tackle here soon, was pretty loaded at the defensive tackle position. So they made him almost a stand-up edge player. And then he gets to the, the combine, and he was oversized for that at Auburn. He gets to the, the combine, he's over 300 pounds. I think he's going to be a – Michael Bennett type. He's a high energy player. When you think of a 4-3 set, he's going to be your heavy strong side end. Probably kick him inside. Real heavy hands, good upper body strength, moves pretty well for a defensive tackle. I don't think he has a future of dropping into coverage though and being a 3-4 outside linebacker type that he played at Auburn. I went a different direction with my number five guy. Uh, I picked uh, Davon Hamilton of Ohio State, uh, similar mm. to Gallimore, a guy that you, you probably wish you saw a little bit more from. 
but the physical skill set is pretty interesting. Six three and three quarters, three twenty, and uh, he had a productive year last year. Not a great year, but a productive year. A lot of good people on that Ohio defense, uh, Ohio State defense. Excuse me. A lot of those guys have to wait their turn, then they get their shot to to show who they are, and then they move on to the National Football League. Matt, I did want to ask you since you have the scout background among us, when you would see a guy really step out at the Senior Bowl uh, and and have a really good Senior Bowl week, not just in the game, but in the practices. Uh, Hamilton did that this year. How how high up and how far up can you move on a draft board based on the Senior Bowl? Um, I got to say somewhat that can be a trap. You know, you get there and maybe you're a little bit more accustomed or comfortable right off the bat because that's a difficult situation. Those first couple practices I'm talking about. I mean, you're a fish out of water. And it does help the big people a little bit because there are a lot of one-on-one situations. I would do my best not to overreact to that, but it's certainly a piece of the puzzle. I mean, a guy like Aaron Donald, who Dale mentioned, you know, we're, we're, t- we're talking about, boy, he's so small. How's he going to hold up at the Senior Bowl? Well, he, he took everyone's lunch money at the Senior Bowl. You know, I mean, that just was another box to check. Stick with you uh, moving down the line here, Matt. Uh, Jordan Elliott at number four. Yeah, I like Elliott. I don't love him. I think he's a really solid all-around player. Um, he ran his 10-yard split really, really well at the Combine. Shows a good get-off. Got a lot of attention at Missouri. I mean, unlike the Auburn situation I mentioned, he was kind of the only show in town, constantly doubled. Um, wasn't super productive, but he you know, played well and affected the game snap after snap. Dale, your number four is... I got Justin, Justin Matabique. Yeah, um, you know he's he's another guy who has some uh, speed and athleticism. Uh, he, he entered the draft as a true a true junior, uh, which you know there's still some upside there. But he's six three two ninety three. I think he'll kind of continue to grow into his man strength and and uh, you know I, I just this this is a tough group to to look at. It, it was in part because of some of the things that Matt just mentioned uh, about the the Missouri kid. I mean. You know, you get guys like, like uh, uh, you know, the two Auburn guys, and, you, and, and so they kind of play off of each other. But a lot of these guys were kind of lone dogs, and, and teams could double them, or, or the colleges did different things with, the, with them. And so, I mean, this really was a difficult, uh, again, splitting hairs with some of these guys, uh, you know, all the way down, other than the, the top couple of guys. After that, it was pretty much, a, a, you know, splitting hairs. Yeah, and, uh, our lists are starting to uh, reflect as much. Uh, my number four is Ross Blacklock from TSU, or excuse me, TCU. Uh, and mostly that's just because he missed all of 2018 with an injury. And I'm, I'm sure that'll get checked out somehow, some way before the draft. But uh, that's the reason why I have him down at number four. Uh, Dale, you've got him at number three. And uh, Matt, you've got him at number three. So we're all kind of in the same boat on him. And uh, the top two guys, I think, uh, are maybe a little bit ahead of the rest uh, in terms of separation. Uh, although, uh, Dale, uh, Javon Kinlaw, uh, he, he might be uh, one of the more interesting guys in this draft in addition to being probably one of the best at his position. Yeah, I mean, you look at him, the, the size, uh, 6'5", 324, um, just a, a monster um, can do everything that you want a defensive lineman to do. Uh, he just needs to, again, be more consistent. That's a, that seems to be a common theme with a lot of these guys, other than maybe uh, Derek Brown, I think, who's everybody's top guy. Uh, Kinlaw, uh, you know, there's there's a little bit of maybe uh, a bigger uh, Jadavian Clowney there. You, you see these flashes where, where, wow, where did that come from? And then, the, you know, the next three or four plays, you're like, is he still on the field? Um, you know, so the, the talent is there. Somebody's just got to tap into that. Interesting about Kinlaw is you mentioned his story, Mike. I mean, he was homeless for a large portion of his life. He gets to South Carolina, realizes food is free for athletes, gets really heavy, (laughs) doesn't stop eating. And then somebody pulls him aside and said, hey, you you could be an NFL star if you just kind of slimmed down. And now he's back on that track. He's kind of a, a Chris Jones type of dude, too. Really long. I mean, he's now the new prototype, like we talked about to start the show. Yeah, you know, that, that backstory story is, is, is so compelling. And uh, as he t- 
told Kim Jones during the NFL Network's combine coverage, uh, there were many, many times where he could have, as he put it, fell victim. So, so yeah. you're scout, you're scout, you're position coach. Uh, you, you come across this tremendous uh, physical skill set, and he's got this backstory that not many have. Uh, how does that uh, factor in, Matt? What, do you look at that and say, well, look how far he's come. There's something to this guy. Or do you think, boy, this guy's really outside the box. We better double check. I think there's two ways, and maybe this hurts a little bit considering the virus situation going on, is if some people in that desperate situation are thrilled to just make that living, get that first paycheck, their family's set, and never loved football, and it was just an avenue, a means to an end, where some might look at it and be tough as nails, scrap, or do anything to get by, and translates that to the football field as well. So he's a guy... I'm not downplaying his story. I mean, it's a remarkable one, but you'd love to have him in your building if you're picking 10 through 16 and you're thinking about taking him. Does he love football or is he just doing it to get paid because his family didn't have any money? Interesting take. Uh, number one, we're uh, in unanimous agreement. Uh, either none of us knows what the hell we're doing or we're all pretty smart, but uh, we've all got Derek Brown of Auburn. Uh, number one on our list. Dale, uh, I like to boil this stuff down. You've done enough of these with me now. Sometimes I don't like to overthink it. This guy's an SEC Defensive Player of the Year. Good enough? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you were the Defensive Player of the Year in that conference, uh, knowing what Alabama and, and LSU also have uh, on the defensive side of the ball, you got to be pretty good. And, and uh, you know, he's a stud. Uh, he'll be uh, if he's if he's not a top five pick, he'll be picked soon there after that. Uh, again, 6'5", 322, uh, another just physical monstrosity that, uh, you know, who knows, 20 years ago they might have tried to make him an offensive tackle. Uh, you know, now he's a, he's a defensive lineman that just uh, gets up the field, just completely wrecks games. He, he's just a stud. He's a monster. I mean, there's some people down on him because his combine wasn't great and – Boy, he ran a terrible three-cone. I bet he trained 10 seconds for that three-cone drill because it doesn't matter at all. I turn mean, he the tape is, on. It doesn't matter. Right. I mean, turn the tape on. He takes LSU and Bama offensive linemen and throws them out of the saloon time and time again. He's bigger, more powerful than everybody on the field. He's very freaky. Throw him out of the saloon. Is that a scouting thing or is that yours? Because I really That's me. like I'm, that. I'm just pulling that one out of my own. I really like that. I think Dale and I both, uh, <laughs> We've never been thrown out of the saloon. That's... <laughs> Anybody else, guys, that uh, got your attention that, that didn't crack the top five? I know the, uh, the Davis twins are interesting because they're twins, uh, probably uh, more so than their capability as prospects. But uh, uh, I think there was uh, some separation. A couple of these uh, – position groups that we've talked about wide receiver certainly was one very deep I think there's quality here in defensive tackle but maybe not as deep as some of the other positions yeah I would agree with that Mike and, and there's some other uh, you know kind of guys that you look at like, like Raekwon Davis from Alabama uh, it's 6'6 311 um, you know coming out of that Alabama defense you know he's been coached well uh, he, he's got the size he's got the length that uh, you know again 15, 20 years ago, he would have been an ideal uh, uh, guy for a 3-4 uh, defensive lineman, uh, just looking to, to kind of eat up blockers and those kind of things. But he can get to the quarterback a little bit. There, there's some nose tackle types in this, in this draft as well that, that are maybe a little further down the list. And, and uh, the kid out of Utah, uh, Fotu, is uh, – what is he, Matt? About 6'5", uh, 350, something along those lines. In that neighborhood. He's got yeah. that Haloti Nada look about him. Right. Yeah, yeah, played rugby like Nada as well. So, I, I mean, that's a guy that's just a complete space eater. Off, doesn't offer a lot as a pass rusher, but if you're looking for somebody just to, to uh, you know, grab two or three guys in the middle of the field and, and not allow them to go anywhere, a guy that's 6'5 and 340 will certainly do that. Well, that's not the, that's not the last time we're going to hear about that Utah defense as we go through these, is it? That, yeah, what a, fasc True. what a fascinating group. Yeah, they've got a little bit of everything there. Matt, any final thoughts on the defensive tackle position? Not really. I mean, I think we all touched on them. I think any list you find would have Kinlaw and Brown at the top. 
Uh, Blacklock would be in probably everyone's top five. And then kind of like we've talked about, it gets a little foggy. I mean, and how you're going to rank those next four or five guys. They're probably all day two type of players. Half of them will probably hit. And it's an okay class. It's not a great class. I mean, I would give it a, probably a B minus overall. All right, that's going to do it for defensive tackles, and that's going to do it for this edition of NFL Draft Triple Take. Uh, remember to keep it uh, here at Steelers.com, and uh, that's the place you're going to find whatever you need to know before the draft. Uh, the NFL Draft coming up April the 23rd through the 25th. For uh, Matt Williamson and Dale Lolly, I'm Mike Persuna. We will talk to you soon.